as the assistant district attorney in the New York District Attorney's Office from 1979 to 1984. She then litigated international commerce matters in New York City at Pavia and Harcourt, where she served as an associate and then partner from 1984 to 1992. In 1991, President George H.W. Bush nominated her to the U.S. District Court, Southern District of New York, and she served in that role from 1992 to 1998. She served as a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit from 1998 to 2009. Please join me now in welcoming United States Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. take my breath away to be in front of crowds this big. No matter how much public speaking I do, it's still a little scary, you know? Um, I'm so delighted to be here. Gail, thank you for that introduction. And Gail of the Forum, thank you for both of you combining to work together to bring this about. Both organizations, the Bar Association and the Forum, are such important vehicles for citizens to think about and engage in the issues of society. And that's going to be a little bit of my uh, talk today, which is, why did I go into the law? You heard Gail talk about, by the way, if you read my book, you'll know that I was not, that I was a very active child, very curious, and got myself into trouble constantly. Um, for you kids, when my cousins had children, they used to, and the children misbehaved, they would look at them and say, you're as bad as your cousin Sonia. <laughs> and so one day I looked at them and said, did I grow up okay? <laughs> They'll grow up okay too. So don't take the criticism too strongly, okay? Um, but my mom, because of how much energy I had, called me ahi which in Spanish means hot pepper. One of those jumping beans. Um, and because of that, I hate podiums. I'm gonna walk among you, all right? And I'll keep talking. At some point, Gail will stand up and go like this. That's what she told me. And I'll stop talking and we'll get to questions. But you will see standing up around the room these nice gentlemen and women, ladies, that have little little plugs in their ear, their job is to protect me. Possibly not from you, but from myself. <laughs> but they also don't like it when people get up unexpectedly. Um, and so as I'm walking around, please don't get, those around me don't get up and scare them. Otherwise, they'll take me off the floor. So let me just move around you and, and talk more casually, okay? You heard about Perry Mason. I was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. And um, at that time, regrettably, because I think medicine has changed, the way they thought to inspire me was to tell me everything I couldn't do and then tell me everything I could do. And I remember looking down the list of the things that I couldn't do. And one of them was law enforcement. But that really got to me, you see, because I had started reading Nancy Drew. <laughs> and this diagnosis, this was about when I was closer to nine, by the way. And I wanted to be a detective. And I knew detectives were law enforcement. And only as a nine, nine and a half year old could be dramatic. I thought my life had ended. What was I gonna do with it? Then, luckily, I started looking at, um, at Perry Mason. And for the people closer to my age in the room, um, and that means a whole lot of us, you remember who Perry Mason is, right? For all the kids in the room who don't, Perry Mason was the first TV lawyer. 
And unlike today where the plot changes every week, the plot in Perry Mason was absolutely the same every week. <laughs> the first half of the show, he investigated the crime his client was charged with. The second half of the show, he went into the courtroom and proved his client not guilty. I've been a judge for 23 odd years. I've actually never had a lawyer break a witness down to confess in the courtroom. <laughs> I, it just doesn't happen. They didn't know that, OK? But I figured out that investigating was part of a lawyer's job. And so I thought to myself, uh, I'm like, I can do this. They had doctor, lawyer, engineer, and I thought I could be a lawyer. And so that set me to thinking about law as a profession. I had no lawyers in my family. I really understood, I barely understood what law was or what it did other than uh, Perry Mason, who proved his clients innocent in the courtroom. Well, you would think I'd want to be a defense attorney. But in one episode, I looked at the end of the case and Perry had proven his client not guilty, and yet the show didn't end. It didn't end until Perry Mason turned to the judge and said, Your Honor, something like, Your Honor, I move to have the charges against my client dismissed and be discharged from bail. And the judge said, so ordered, bailiff released the defendant. And I had a sort of um, aha moment. The most important person in that room was the judge. All the work Perry Mason had done didn't end the case. The judge ended the case. And I thought to myself, I'd rather be that judge. <laughs> now, that's the unsophisticated reason that I decided to be a lawyer, because that was when I was 10, 11, 12, in that time frame. So why did that dream continue? Well, it continued because as I grew older and I was watching the society around me, I realized that what the law did. Now, coming from the area that I lived in, the South Bronx, at that time in the Fort Apache zone, there's a movie about Fort Apache. And when you see it, it was the most crime-ridden area of the United States at the time. And drug problems were rampant. Now we're talking about 1950s, early 1960s. Every Saturday night, there was a squad of police officers who would come to the store my aunt and I worked in. She worked in, I worked part-time. And they'd be um, dressed with uh, bulletproof vests and uh, machine guns and all this other gear. But they came to our store to take us home because the streets were not safe at night. So I knew they were guardians. And I knew that they were important to the order of my neighborhood. Yet, on the other side of that, so many of them were arresting people we knew and people we loved, including some of my relatives. And then add to it the moment of seeing them do things that were not, in my judgment, in the best interest of the neighborhood. We had street vendors back then of fruits and vegetables. Actually, I saw them in the South Bronx before I saw them in mid Manhattan. Um, and one day, a police car comes up and orders about two full shopping bags of fruits and vegetables and uh, goes like this to reach for his wallet. And the vendor says, no, 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 that's for you. And the police officer takes the fruit and goes away without paying. Now today there are anti-corruption laws that would prohibit that. 
But I stood and thought to my, I asked the man, why did you do that? And his answer was, I have to do business. And I thought to myself, does that policeman know that that vendor is scraping together his life? That he, fed, he likely has a wife and kids that he's trying to feed? And that those two shopping bags are, they probably are a very sizable part of whatever little profit he makes. And I realized, no, it's not likely the police officer thought of it. And I realized that was because we often don't think about what others are experiencing. We know what we're experiencing. And I'm sure that police officer thought of it as a thank you for the protection he gave the neighborhood. But that thank you is a very costly thank you. And so I had conflicting feelings about the law. It is good for the community, but it can also not be good. Um, my friends and relatives are getting arrested. So what do I do with the hardship that my families and friends were experiencing? And yet at the same time, my other family and friends were experiencing high levels of crime. Because in the South Bronx, the pocketbook thefts, the burglaries, the killings, the assaults, they were happening to the people in the neighborhood. Yes, it happened to other people outside the neighborhood, but most of the crime was from within. So how do you deal as a child that lived in that environment? How do you come to an understanding of law that can be positive? And so I had to really think within. And I had to figure out what was the purpose of law. And as I thought about it, I realized what the law does is not just to protect people, but to organize its relationships. That's really the function of law. I tell kids when I speak to them, and I don't mean to put you on their level, by the way, but there is something to understanding things in very basic forms. The law affects the structure of our community, starting from something that affects you every single day. Everybody who's alive and leaves their home comes into contact with green and red lights. You go on green, and you stop on red. And if you don't, you'll get a ticket. You may get fined, maybe not. So why do you obey the law? Just because the law tells you not to do it? No, because you realize and understand that if we don't follow that law, we will create chaos. And none or very few of us would reach where we're going safely. So what do we do? We give up some of our autonomy under law to be able to protect the greater whole from injury. And there are many, many other laws that control our behavior our relationship with one another, and for the better. But with laws comes sacrifice, comes a sense of we have to give something up. The law can't, by definition, protect every interest. We have to make choices about which interests we are going to give benefits to or advantages to. It's just not enough resources. 
There's too many conflicting demands on the society. And that's the vibrancy of law. It's the vibrancy of society. And it's one that for me, at least in choosing my profession, I understood would give me a vehicle to do what I thought was right in a way that was ordered, that wasn't arbitrary and capricious. It wasn't my making a choice like the police officer about whether he would take the bag or not, just as it's not my choice, my unique personal choice, to decide what's good or bad for the litigants in front of me. All I can do is apply the law according to the best understanding I can give it. And so what does that do, applying the law? For me, service. Not just service as a judge or a justice, but service as a lawyer. You see, for the many lawyers in this room, and I understand that I think you may be the greatest profession members in the room, we sometimes, in the hustle and bustle of making money, trying to stay alive, getting clients, doing the countless pro bono activities that lawyers do, that and those demands really make us forget what I perceive to be the fundamental nature of law. We help people. We help people with problems. Or we help them better their relationships. Whether you're a transactional lawyer trying to help businesses or institutions to better their services, better their relationships with employees, better their business ventures, you're still helping. Whether you're a litigator practicing any field of law, um, whether it's trust in estates like your incoming president does, or it's uh, criminal law or civil law, you're helping people in some relationship that either the individual or the institution has among themselves or with people or between people. And if you practice with a sense of integrity and with a sense of honor and with a sense of remembering the primary goal of lawyering, which is service, then I think you can practice the way I felt was the right way to practice and where you can continue always to enjoy the profession because it will be meaningful to you. I often talk to lawyers and say to them, in the end, the legal code that punishes you for a violation of professionalism is only a floor. It's not the ceiling of behavior. And I use a small example. How many lawyers in this room have served papers at five o'clock on a Friday, three-day weekend? <laughs> it's happened to me. I hated it, hated the lawyers, and really felt badly about my profession. All right? Look at the black eye you give the profession when you choose to do that. There's nothing in the law books that says that's unethical, or you're gonna be fined for it, or penalized for it. But that's not the way I want us to choose to practice. And that are the choices we have to make as individuals who have committed to the practice of law. You have to have a passion about what you do whether you're a lawyer or you're some other profession, you've chosen it. Now, some people say to me, I didn't choose it, I had to find a job, this is what I ended up doing. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, sometimes we're sort of 
stuck with it, okay? But you're not stuck with the worst of what you do. You're never stuck in deciding how to better what you're in, whether it's the community you live in or the larger city or state or nation. You have your choice of what to give to make it better. And that holds true for the country. To all the kids in this room, if you do nothing else in public service, vote. Because that's the only way. Because really, that's the only way that we, as a nation, can, will have the majority really rule. Because that's what the representative nation was built on was citizen participation in creating and bettering our society. You know, many of the terms of the Constitution are written in very broad language. Primary example of that is the Fourth Amendment. No unreasonable search and seizures. Well, the definition of unreasonableness doesn't have really a dictionary limit. It has a judgment in it. And that judgment was what our forefathers wanted us to grow with, to understand in the context of the society that we live in and of what's happening within that society. And so all of these things are calling upon us, including our Constitution, to be involved citizens, to help the courts make judgments about what's fair for the society, how to read its rules and apply them in a way that the legislature meant. Um, but that explains, or this explains, why I chose to be a lawyer. It's a profession I love. I describe it often as the most noble of professions. We are the only profession that requires its members to do pro bono service as a part of our code of behavior. Not every lawyer does it. Some of you here probably do. <laughs> I know the people up on that stage do. Um, but it's the only profession that requires that. The Hippocratic Oath only requires doctors to do no harm. It doesn't tell them to do their services for free. <laughs> All right? Um, these are important measures of what lawyering should be about. And so I invite you, as members of this group, as we have our conversation today, I hope that you, those of you who have read my book, will think of questions that I left unanswered for them. But I probably did a very bad job if I did that. Too many questions. <laughs> but for the others, I hope that you will understand how passionate I am, not just about the law, but about the work I do. I see it as a gift to me, um, a gift in being a voice in deciding some of the most important legal questions the nation faces. And as I remind people constantly, whether you agree with the majority decision of the court or not, please do remember that myself and every one of my colleagues share one thing in common. We passionately passionately care about the Constitution and our system of government. We can and do disagree sometimes on, oh, she just said it to me, on what's best, what's the best answer, but it's not that disagreement is not born 
from ill will or bad motives. It's born from what we think the answer is under the law. And that's why we can disagree and in our written barbs be very strong. But as individuals, we remain collegial because we respect each other's goodwill. And I think if we do that as a society generally, it would be a better place for our government to be. So I've just been told by Gail this. <laughs> so, Phil, I think you're up next. I think so. OK. Um, first of all, thank you, Justice. Thank you. As is tradition, Justice, the first two questions are going to come from our high school guests seated over here. And, uh, before I've I'll done this again. I should have started on this end. I forgot. Well, as you make your way over there, I'll just remind the audience that if you have questions, again, just fill them out, and um, one of our uh, volunteers will come pick them up from you and bring them to the front. All right. If so we, anyone whose question is asked, you can get up and wait till I come near you, and I'm going to ask the photographer to take a picture of us. Gail, yeah, do we still have the photographer there? So start oh, okay. starting with our high school students, I'd ask uh, the first student to uh, introduce himself and, or herself and where they go to school and then ask your question. Absolutely, thank you. Good evening, uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Isis Benjamin. Don't get too scared by the name. <laughs> with our pre-law program, our magnet program at Palm Beach Lakes Community High School. And I'm very excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, should I wait until she comes to ask the question? Or can I ask okay. Yep. Uh, my question is, historically, which Supreme Court justice have you admired most and why? <sighs> I often don't answer this question. Because every time a justice does, the academics and lawyers spend their entire time dissecting that justice's <laughs> work. You give them business, okay? And then they write articles about how the justice is or is not like the person they admire. So it's a bad thing. So I go play it very safe, okay? I play it by picking a justice at the beginning of our history who I think made the greatest impact on the court system. And that was John Marshall. In a case called Madison versus uh, Marbury, uh, and if you ever read the case, understand the background of that case. One of the two parties had been given a commission by the president to be a judge. That was Madison. And yet, doing, and, and Marbury as well. And the issue before the court was, when the president changed, were they supposed to uh, was he a judge already? Because the president had signed the commission, the prior president had signed the commission saying he was. Now, Judge Madison, Chief or Justice Madison, with no explicit text in the Constitution, nothing in the Constitution says that the Supreme Court is the last word on the constitutionality of law. At that time, in half of the nations of the world, Parliament was the only body who could say what the law was. And Parliament could override any decision by their Supreme Court. And that actually was the way of government and the courts in the vast majority of nations. And so Madison, had to look at the structure of our government and announce its separation of powers, its three equal functions in, in importance. And what he basically said, the legislature makes the law, the president enforces it, and the courts 
decide whether it's constitutional or not. And that was revolutionary for that time. And so I admire him because what he did was not just merely reinforce the importance of the courts, but to take an absence in the Constitution and determine its meaning from, its, from the Constitution's structure. And that is an art of judging that we somehow take for granted today, but wasn't taken for granted back then. So he's been very much a hero to me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and uh, hello, Justin Sotomayor. I currently attend Jeremy Leonard, and I am currently an aspirante. Um, this will be my last year. So on behalf of my fellow aspirantes and myself, I have the following question to ask you. As a supporter of Aspira, who has gone on to become highly successful, what is your perception of leadership qualities of my generation, and what advice can you give us? Hmm. The best leaders I know are the people who are prepared to lead. You have to be willing to accept the responsibility. See, leadership is a great burden. Not only are you busy when you're leading to make sure things are going right and to inspire others to follow you, but you have to have a vision of what you want to do. And you have to have a vision that's informed by a lot of hard work, because you have to study whatever it is that you want to do and figure out how to do it best. But you have to be, have the drive to want to do it. And so Gail and I were talking about that earlier. Um, to be a good leader, you have to be a good student. And I don't mean just getting A's in school. I mean being curious about the things you're doing and how to better them. And that takes learning. And it takes watching and looking at others who have been successful, looking at what others have done that has not been successful, and figuring out a way to avoid those problems. It takes a lot of thought. And then at the end, it takes courage. The courage to challenge others to understand what you're, why what you're proposing makes sense. And sometimes people won't, or they take a long time to come around to your point of view. So you have to, to have the stay to it attitude that lets leaders surround themselves with people who become to believe like them. And book smarts is not necessary. But people smarts, and caring smarts, and working hard smarts are what counts. Good luck to you. Thank you. Well, Justice, we have quite a few questions that have been submitted from the audience, so I'll uh, just jump I'll in. I'll let you and then figure it out. Go ahead. <laughs> Several of our uh, uh, audience members would like to know from of being a Supreme Court Justice. <sighs> Knowing that in every case I cast a vote, there's going to be a losing side. You know, people think of the courts as Solomonic. Um, and I don't know where we got this idea that Solomon was wise, or Solomon, okay? Because think of what he did. He threatened to divide a child in half. And if he had guessed wrong about the drive of a mother, it would have been a really sad story, okay? But we think of Solomon as someone who tries to find the right answer through provoking people to do the right thing. Well, regrettably, that's not what law is. Law and the court, especially the Supreme Court, is a dispute between people that they can't resolve. It's a claim of right 
between two people or two groups, about entitlement, about constitutional empowerment. And these questions, we announce the winner. But the second half of that winning for one side is that another side has lost. And every side who loses feels that they have been deprived of something. And I can't forget that when I'm ruling. I don't, or didn't realize, how much I relied on my, when I was on the lower, lower courts, on the fact that there were courts above me that could correct my worst mistakes. There's really nobody above us anymore. <laughs> when we make a mistake, it's bad. And so that's the hardest part of being a justice. Thank you. Our audience would like to know whether there's laughter with your colleagues behind the scenes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> just the other day, we, had, we eat lunch after every argument and after every Friday conference, OK? And there's a lunchroom rule. We don't talk about cases. Uh, it's the reason for that. Uh, we don't want to get into fights at lunch, OK? <laughs> <laughs> we spent an entire hour with my colleagues regaling all of us with stories of the funniest questions Justice Breyer has asked. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who have never been in the courtroom, Justice Breyer is fond of hypotheticals, but they go on so long that most people lose where he's at. <laughs> and often he, he himself loses where he's at. <laughs> and um, he'll say things that make people laugh. So yes, we have a lot of laughter. Um, Justice Scalia loves to sing, and he remembers the funniest ditties that ever existed, songs I've never heard of but have words that often are a little off color. <laughs> Not badly so, but they're often funny. So yes, we do have humor among ourselves. What is your view on whether video should be released of Supreme Court proceedings as opposed to just audio? I started out, if not in favor, neutral because I saw the plus and, benef plus and minuses of cameras in the Supreme Court. I think I'm going more negative, and some of the answers I'm going to give is not going to appeal to some lawyers. I think the temptation to grandstand in front of a camera is so huge, and especially when you have almost an entire nation of some lay people and a lot of lawyers looking at you perform in front of the Supreme Court, the need to make a good impression, I think will be overpowering on too many lawyers. But I'm not blaming the lawyers. I think it may be overpowering on justices. And I think it may change our dy dynamic. You know, a lot of times in oral argument, the justices are talking to each other about their views of a case through the lawyer. It's the first time that we're having a conversation. And our questions are intended in many circumstances to sort of point to our colleagues the things we're troubled by, the difficulties with an approach that you hear them having a preference for. I think that exchange will grow worse if we're on television. So I'm not sure it's a really good thing. Um, I hope Congress in its zeal to make things public remembers a bunch of different things. The first one is that many senators say that the Senate and its collegiality ended when cam cameras came into the legislative session. Because then, what they were doing was public to everyone. And so they couldn't look like they were friendly towards the other side because their 
constituents might think that they were giving up an important position if they were sitting there with an adversary on a position. Secondly, unlike them, we do have a full transcript and audio of what's happening in the courtroom available. And so it's not like we're hiding anything from the public. They know what's happened. They can hear the questions. Um, they can hear the argument. What this will avoid are the, the evil that I pointed to, which is this temptation to use it as a stage rather than a courtroom. So I am moving more closely to saying I think it might be a bad idea. What do you think about those who decry judicial activism, yet petition the court to declare laws unconstitutional? Hmm. <laughs> that is a contradiction in terms, isn't it? <laughs> I think most judges have a definition of judicial activism. It's a ruling you don't like. <laughs> I challenge anyone in this room to pick up a decision and actually read it. Please don't read what the legal commentators are doing. Read the decision from beginning to end. Read a decision where there's a majority and a dissent. And what you will find out is that both sides always base it on a legal analysis. We don't come to our conclusions willy-nilly or arbitrarily. We have a way of, approach, of approaching interpretation, whether it's constitutional or statutory, and we use that approach sometimes to come to different answers. Why? Because in terms of interpretive principles, we have a legal toolbox with a lot of different tools in there. And when we're looking at a question, we're ordering the use of those tools. Some are more important than others. Some don't get used for particular reasons. My colleague, Nina Scalia, has just read a, written a book on uh, interpretive principles, and there's 800 of them. So, and he has his own way of saying this is more important than that. I will tell you that any principle he says is more than important than that, I can point to a decision he's re written where he hasn't done it that way. <laughs> All right? Um, and this is not because he wants to uh, arrive at a particular answer. It's because every law is different. Every law has the use of different words, comes from a different history, has a different purpose, and so there are no fixed meaning to law. A legislature writes a law because they perceive that something is bad, that something bad has happened that they want to fix. But all they're thinking about is that one factual situation. But human life is such that the next situation is going to be that close to that old case. So how far is close? And that is the difficulty in this process. Um, in the end, we do believe in law, and there won't be any decision you read where you will think that a judge is an activist. Every judge is trying to do the best he or she can to enforce the law as he and she believes it is written. What surprised you most when you became a Supreme Court Justice? How public it is. <laughs> Did you guys watch that, that uh, barrage of photographs of me? I had to shoo them away so I could eat. <laughs> and even when I did that, people were still trying to take pictures of me putting soup in my mouth, okay? <laughs> you have no idea what it's like to be in a restaurant 
and you're about to put a fork to your mouth, and at the table in front of you, you see somebody with a cell phone just over the lip of the desk. <laughs> a couple of summers ago, I went home, and I had invited a group of friends to come over to my place. And one of my girlfriends had met up with me to help me go shopping. And we were discussing how to cook the dish we were thinking of preparing. And the next afternoon, well, that afternoon, I think, there's an internet blog. Sotomayor in her home uh, neighborhood, arguing with a friend on how to cook chicken. <laughs> I, who cares? <laughs> but my life has lost any sense of privacy. People say it's my book, and well, my book didn't help, okay? <laughs> but we are looked at by the world. We get visitors um, from judicial systems from everywhere. Not just chief judges from those countries, but other justices. We get judges from all levels of their legal system. We get ministers from foreign countries that are involved in legal issues that come and study our courts. We meet with them, talk with them, share the knowledge we have, um, we try to help in whatever ways we can. But the attention is not just lawyers and law firms. The attention comes from every segment of this society. And I knew there was a lot of attention to the Supreme Court, but because I was a judge and a lawyer before then, I thought it was limited to the legal profession. Well, it's much broader than that. And that very much surprised me. Your recent appearance at the 2014 Gershwin Awards has uh, prompted the following questions. Are you a fan of Billy Joel's music and what's your favorite song? <laughs> Who isn't a fan in this room of Billy Joel? <laughs> um, you know, he's an iconic songwriter and singer. Um, he's written, and such an observant human being, about the condition of people. Um, and whether it's his songs from The Coal Mine to my favorite, Piano Man, um, I just admire how he can capture the spirit of entirely different segments of our society. Um, and so, yes, there may be songs, and I can't think of one immediately, that I don't like as much as others, but I think that's true of any artist you like. Um, but you can admire the talent. And it was a wonderful evening. I got calls from my friends to say, what was it like sitting next to Billy Joel? <laughs> and it was really great. Has there ever been a case you secretly hoped would make it to the Supreme Court? Oh, <laughs> secretly hoped. I won't tell you which, but there are a lot of cases I wish never did. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was a lower court judge, both on the district court and on the Court of Appeals, um, you can almost tell from our writings what cases a judge below thinks are important enough to warrant Supreme Court review. Um, some telltale signs are when a court really tries hard to tell you how much of a circuit split there is below. Because if judges don't want you to take the case, they either won't mention the split or they'll try to distinguish themselves away from the split. I, know, I think the lawyers in the room understand what I'm saying, okay? Um, and sometimes they'll tell you, we need guidance from the court. I've signed on to a couple of those, but I can't tell you right now which ones those are. But it's fairly self-evident when you think an issue is important and the court should review it. That's what usually gets our attention in the cert petition, because most often the lawyers will quote something from the court below to signal to us that it's an important case we should be paying attention. 
Does today's partisan political environment prevent good jurists from enduring the confirmation process? God, I didn't want to. I mean, you know, I have been through two, two prior processes. I um, had some grave doubts about whether I should um, agree to be reviewed by the president's team. Um, the idea of subjecting myself to the process was so both frightening and unsavory. You know, um, I, the president, in as I was leaving our interview, when he first met me, um, said to me, Judge, remember I was on the Court of Appeals back then, uh, from this moment forward, please tell your friends not to tell you what the news is talking about. The press is a distorted mirror, whether it's for you or against you. And they rarely understand how they're impacting the individuals they're talking about. And so I followed his advice. And my law clerks every day would create a newspaper for me online, cutting out all the articles about it. <laughs> That's how I kept up on the world. I didn't watch TV except for the All-Star Game. Um, and as I was flipping through the channels, on one of them I saw a streamer with my face on it, and I went, oh god, I can't escape this. Um, yes, I, there are judges and people applying for government offices who are good people, who could do great work, who don't say yes because of the burdens. It's an enormous burden we're putting on our public servants when we're looking at things that sometimes really don't matter. I'm told we have time for two more questions. Um, the first one, uh, you recently told a Utah audience that you, quote, don't actually feel like you belong in any of the worlds you inhabit completely. What do you mean by that comment? You only have to read the internet to know that they say I'm very different from my colleagues. I am. I come from a background they don't. And um, not just from dancing salsa, but a little bit from, um, from the passion of my personality. One day, Justice Scalia, as I was trying to convince him of something, turned to me and he said, Sonny, I love you. You're a bulldog. You just won't give up when you're trying to pursue something. I took it as a compliment, OK? But my colleagues are not bulldogs. I am. <laughs> Um, but that is a part of my personality. It's a part of my upbringing. My colleagues all love the opera. I like jazz and dance. Those little differences do make you sometimes feel different. And on the other side of it, you know, I tell a story in my book about going when I was a prosecutor to the project of uh, where some of my witnesses lived. Very um, unassuming home, very clean. And as I sat on the chair, and there was a standing lamp next to me, there was a cockroach walking up the standing lamp. And I started to shake. And I ran out of there without really finishing. And I realized as I ran out that I had changed. Because I grew up with cockroaches and water bugs. The best story that my family ever had was my cousin who was dating a non-Hispanic and brought her to my grandmother's house. And it was a wintry day, and all the boots were in the bathroom. And she put her foot into one of the boots, and there was a mouse in it. OK? It's the world I grew up in. And my grandmother also was very clean. But when you live in tenements the way we did, it was almost impossible to control what happened in your home vis-a-vis -vis these uh, little rodents. Um, 
You change. Yes, you change. But you don't become completely something else. You carry with you that background, that, that sense of who you are, what family is, what friends are, what's appropriate or inappropriate. Sometimes you learn that your behaviors are not appropriate and you try to fit in more. Sometimes it sneaks out. Um, it is hard to leave one's background and to enter worlds that are totally alien to you and ever feel 100% like you belong. And once you've left, you don't feel 100% of what you left either. And so you walk carefully, trying to take as much enjoyment as you can from every world that you inhabit um, and try to find your own center after a while. We'll close with a lighter question. As a native of the Bronx and an avid baseball fan, our audience would like to know if the Yankees should keep Alex Rodriguez. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are the students who ask the questions? Because I want to take pictures with them. Isaac and... Uh, here, here. Okay. Where are you guys? Where's my... Thanks, sir. Thank you all for joining. Uh, remind everyone to uh, attend the February 20th luncheon with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.